Okay guys, this is Mr. Chandler and I'm just going to do a very, very quick overview of the story of the bank war, which is the subject of potential essay question number two uh, for the uh, unit four study guide. Uh, all right, so uh, to start off, uh, you have to talk about the causes of the bank war, uh, which is really, um, it's a political issue, right? So we know that the National Bank, the second bank of the United States, was established in 1816 on a 20-year charter. That meant that they would be up for renewal in 1836. But instead, in 1832, the director of the National Bank, Nicholas Biddle, um, uh, went to Congress and asked them to go ahead and renew it early, to do a 20-year charter that would still not start till 1836, but to do it now, four years early. Now, the question is why? Uh, and it's all about politics. Biddle is a Whig and the Whigs currently controlled Congress. So he goes to the Whigs that control Congress now in 1832 in order to get the bank renewed while they still control, control, control things. But also, um, it's an election year. Jackson is up for re-election, and so it'll be really good. Uh, Biddle looks at this, and it's probably not just Biddle, it's probably the entire Whig -like leadership looked at this as a really win-win situation. Because either Jackson vetoes the bank, right, or he doesn't. If Jackson does veto the bank, it will start to tank the economy, and that'll be good for the Whigs and bad for the Democrats. Um, and it'll show that Jackson is using the veto not for its intended purpose as a check against unconstitutional acts by Congress, but instead for a political purpose of defeating a policy he doesn't like, which is actually how the veto is often used now, but that was never its purpose. And using it that way is very contrary to the entire point of the veto and is kind of tyrannical. It allows the president to overrule Congress anytime he disagrees with them. Um, so it's a win-win for them if he, so it's a win for the Whigs if he vetoes it. If he doesn't veto it, it's still a win for them because they get the bank they wanted, which is a big win for them, good for them politically, but also, it's basically, if Jackson doesn't veto the bank, then he's betraying his own supporters who hate the bank. So really, the Whigs look at this as a win-win situation. Jackson goes to the Whig leadership. Specifically, he meets with Henry Clay and Nicholas Biddle, and he asks them to not make it an election issue. He says, wait till next year, and we'll negotiate. They refuse, they pass it, and so Jackson vetoes it, just like, he, just like they thought he would. And so we have two cartoons here. In this cartoon, we see heavenly lightning bolts flying off of Jackson's veto as the enemies of the bank run away from him. Um, it's actually not his veto. This is him doing something else we're going to talk about in a minute. But we see Nicholas Biddle with the head of a demon there. Um, and then other uh, famous wigs, including Henry Clay and Daniel Webster. Here we have another version. Uh, this is Jackson depicted like a, a king holding the veto in his hand like a weapon, you know, well, not like a weapon really, but holding the veto in his hand, standing on the ruins of the ripped up constitution. The idea being that Jackson is becoming a king and a tyrant. Well, it doesn't work out for the Whigs like they thought it would. Jackson and the Democrats win big, big wins in the election of 1832. And, but when all this went down, Jackson famously told uh, Martin Van Buren, the bank is trying to destroy me, Mr. Van Buren, but I will destroy it. And so Jackson is not content just to veto the bank. He wants to destroy it. So his plan to destroy it is to remove all of the America's money, all of the nation, all of the federal government's money out of the national bank and put it in a series of state banks that his critics call pet banks. They call them his pet banks because he picked them like his prized pets. And specifically, he picked people that had supported him in his re-election bid in 1832. Uh, so that, that uh, order to remove the bank is shown here. So when, uh, when Jackson ordered the, national bank, the, uh, the money to be withdrawn, he had to order his Secretary of the Treasury to do it because only the Secretary of the Treasury has the power to do that. Secretary of the Treasury flat out refused. He said, no, it would be unconstitutional of me to do that. So Jackson orders him to resign. So then he puts in a new Secretary of the Treasury and orders him to do it. And that one also refuses to do it. 
So then he puts in a third person. Um, and this third person that he puts in uh, does do it. Two years later, um, when John Marshall dies, uh, he will be reward uh, that secretary that third secretary of the treasury will be rewarded by being named the Supreme Court Chief Justice in his place and um, well we'll learn how that goes in a later chapter it's very bad for the country but what about the bank war what happens well all the nation's money is in the pet banks which means the national bank can't do anything it has no real power it has no money it can't issue loans. And so it can't also, it can't affect interest rates. And very importantly, it can't affect inflation. Can't do anything to stop inflation. So meanwhile, the state banks start loaning out money like crazy. They start just printing money like crazy. Uh, in 1833, the year this all began, the state bank, uh, all of the banks in the United States, in total, there was about $10 million in circulation. By 1837, there's something like $128 million. So inflation is out of control. Uh, the price of goods skyrockets. Workers' wages actually go up too, which is great. Except this brings us to a concept that we call real wages. Real wages is the difference between what you make and what things cost. And inflation goes up at a higher rate than workers' wages, so their real wages actually go down. So what we're seeing as an effect of the bank war is massive inflation, and we're seeing uh, workers, the working class, the guys who support the Democrats, we're seeing their real wages going down, their quality of life going down. Meanwhile, land speculation is going crazy again, just like it did before the Panic of 1819. Um, in 1830, the federal government sold 2 million acres of land. In 1836, they sold 20 million acres of land. And so things are going crazy. It's speculation fever all over again. Jackson sees this getting out of control. And so right before he leaves office in 1837, he passes an executive order called the Specie Circular. Now remember specie as another word for hard money, which is a term for gold and silver in the case of the United States. And what the Specie Circular says is the federal government is not allowed to sell land unless you pay for it with specie. No more paper money accepted which puts a crash halt to the sale of public land, which causes the price of public land in the aftermarket to drop precipitously. When that happens, the exact same thing that happened in the Panic of 1819 happens. People lose all their money, banks shut down, mass chaos, and we get the Panic of 1837, which makes the Panic of 1819 look mild. Panic of 1837 is really bad for Martin Van Buren and the Democrats. And in 1838, the Whigs win big in Congress, but not big enough to override Van Buren's veto. And so Van Buren, uh, in this cartoon, we see the first appearance of the Democratic donkey, Andrew Jackson whipping the donkey, trying to get it to go through um, with his uh, crazy ideas, while Martin Van Buren walks behind it to catch the donkey's poop in his hat. Uh, and so Van Buren as president is going to be very unpopular because of the Panic of 1837, which it takes a long time to recover from, which he doesn't go, do a good job of dealing with. He refuses to reopen the National Bank. He instead withdraws the money from the state banks and just puts it in the Treasury Department, not in any bank. And so it just sits there stagnant. And so it doesn't really help the economy. It curbs inflation. Things get a little bit better. But the result of this is that in the next election, uh, 1840, the Whig candidate, William Henry Harrison, is going to win. And that is the story of the bank war. Have a good day. See you later.